I have some handouts that I'm going to refer to um, as we go along. So if we could just kind of pass those on. They're going to be on the screen as well. Um, but I often invite my students to write in a writing class. Imagine that. Um, and I would encourage you to uh, pull out a pen or uh, just read along with me as we go through some of these pieces. Just like what was said in my introduction, I teach at the community college here in Sheridan. And one of the things that I'm really excited about having this opportunity um, is the, the differences and some of the, the commonalities and the differences uh, when teaching at the community college level and what I'm learning from my colleagues at the university. I'd first really like to thank the University of Wyoming for this opportunity as well as Wyoming Humanities. Um, it's really a pleasure to be a part of this day um, and it's a great opportunity to share what's happening both um, at the university but here right in Sheridan at our community college. Um, I have a friend I work with at the college that often says we are a community college the community is our campus. So this is a perfect opportunity. You all get to be my students, just like in my classroom. Um, I work uh, mainly with students who are freshmen and sophomores um, coming into the college system for the first time. Um, I do have some non-traditional students, but most of my students are 18 and 19 years old. And they are reluctant students in many cases. Um, <laughs> very reluctant students to show up in a literature classroom. Uh, they, they are at school for all kinds of different reasons, and so I have this big task of teach, telling them, showing them, inspiring them to get excited about words on a page that they really have no idea why they need in their lives. So I have to get excited about things that they're not excited about. Um, so I decided that I would deliver this, this part of my world, that this is the work that I spend most of my time doing, I am a teacher, um, through a journey that I took a couple of years ago. I wanted to keep inspiring my students. I wanted to stay excited about literature, about words, and outdoor literature in particular. So I did something a little bit crazy. Um, this was about three years ago, and I think the people in my life, many of whom are here today, thought this was really crazy. Um, but I, I left my, my two little boys, who are here today, my oldest son, who is 12, said, Mom, I don't think you should call me little. Um, but at the time, he was little, because it was about three years ago. And my wonderful husband and my parents, who live here in Sheridan, and I left and went into the back country for a month. Um, I went out to walk. Um, and I wasn't exactly sure what I was doing, but I spent 30 days living in those tents. Um, all of these photographs are from my 30 days in the backcountry. I spent this time living with teenagers, quite literally, some 17 and 18 year olds, college co-eds, um, and a Jesuit priest. Uh, my mom loves, my favorite joke that my mother loves is that I, I spent a week sleeping with a priest <laughs> in one of these tents. <laughs> um, I, I knew I needed to get outside and I needed to connect with the spaces that made me who I am, the great western spaces that made me who I am. Um, and I had read about this school that takes people into quote unquote remote wilderness to teach them leadership school skills, to teach them outdoor skills and to teach environmental ethics. And I thought this is a great opportunity to connect something that I love with space that I love. Um, I write nonfiction in my work world and I often find myself writing about place. And this seemed like a great way to get back in touch with the ground under my boots. So as a kid, I walked all over. I walked all over Montana. Um, I, wa I hiked through the hills on my family's ranch near Miles City, Montana. I walked up and down the Yellowstone and Tongue Rivers with my mother as a child. As a young woman, I wandered Europe with a backpack on my back, and then a little later on, Appalachia and those smooth mountains of the East Coast. But at this point in my life as a teacher, something was calling me back to these mountains of Wyoming. And so I ended up in Lander, Wyoming at the National Outdoor Leadership School, Knowles. So many of you are very familiar with Knowles, some of you may not be, but I always say I was the world's oldest Knowles student. <laughs> <laughs> Which isn't exactly true, but it was close. Um, my instructors were both younger than I was on this trip. Um, most of my tent mates were younger. 
but I was seeking something very specific that Knowles was offering. This girl from the plains needed something in these mountains. Um, Knowles was founded right here in Wyoming and Lander by Peter Petzl in um, 1965. He had this very strong belief that if we could train good leaders, we could change the world and we could take care of the environment. And one of the concepts that's at the center of Knowles that I was hoping to grab and bring back into my classroom and into my teaching of literature with these reluctant students is this idea that, um, that wilderness, as defined by, the, by, the, by Knowles, is a place where nature is dominant and situations and consequences are real. And I loved that idea that it was immediate consequences, that being outside taking away all those comforts of the world that I was used to could, could teach me something immediate and that I could bring that back into my teaching with my students. So Knowles is built on experiential learning, making mistakes is what that often means, and getting your hands dirty. So I set out to uh, do an outdoor educator course. The course was built specifically for students um, who wanted to work in outdoor education, so work for Knowles or work for an environmental company. But there were also a lot of teachers on this trip that were hoping to bring experiential learning into a really specific classroom. So it turned out to be one of the best classrooms I've ever been in. Um, I went out to those mountains really seeking that dominance of nature. Um, I wanted to reclaim and refine those western landscapes that I felt were so a part of who I am. But I also went in part to ask a really basic question. How do we understand the impact of landscape on human culture and who we are? So I was taking a very physical journey to understand part of that in hopes of understanding what was happening in my classroom. So this is part of my group wandering through the Beartooth Wilderness. We started near Kitty Creek um, outside of Cody, walked through the southeast corner of Yellowstone and kind of out the other side. So we, we weren't in Yellowstone the whole time, but we sort of bordered Yellowstone. I ask my students these same questions all of the time, but they're sitting in a classroom looking at Annie Dillard or Aldo Leopold or Wendell Berry. They're not looking at this trail. Um, and so my goal was that I could bring this back to them. If it were up to me, I would bring every class to Spiro Wigwam and make them sit outside and walk. Um, but I like my family and my, my community and my gym membership way too much <laughs> <laughs> to be a permanent mountain hermit. So I, I loved being out for 30 days, but I was very glad to see my not so little boys anymore. So just as I wandered through the Beartooths, for a month, I asked my students to wander in and out of the annals of outdoor literature to try to understand landscape and how that landscape affects them and how they affect the landscape. Um, and I, through good choices in literature, which we're going to look at today, we can experience the landscape without leaving a classroom or out leaving this, without leaving uh, this room at Spiro. And it feels really powerful to have this outdoor experience to take into my classroom with me. Uh, my students don't have to walk those hundred miles to pull from this literature and my hope is that by reading carefully and closely they will think about the landscape as they make choices about how to spend their time and their energy and even even their careers so each slide, each picture, my slides are mostly about the pictures and the, the excerpts. Um, all of the pictures are from my trip, which has been really fun for me to sort of relive this journey. And I hope that it will reinvigorate the teaching I'm doing even right now. So you get to see a bit of my trip as we go along. So we're going to start with Annie Dillard. Um, on my Knowles trip, um, we, we were wandering through gorgeous spaces like this loop and field often, all the time. It was wonderful. It was pretty hard not to feel excited. Uh, we were also wandering through grizzly country. Um, this was my first extended trip through in grizzly country. Uh, I had spent a little bit of time um, in the Beartooths as a child, one of my first long backpacking trips with my dad. But I was back in this grizzly country and sleeping with the grizzly bears. Um, we, we saw all kinds of wildlife on a daily basis, elk and deer and pronghorn um, when we were walking, but we did not see the bear. We, didn't, we knew they were watching us. Um, we marveled at their scat on the trail and the enormous, really fresh prints that we would see in the mud. But I was by far ready to keep those bears far away from me. We kept our food. Um, 
200 yards from where we were sleeping and another 200 yards from where we were cooking in a portable electric fence. We kept our food there and our toothpaste there to, to, in an attempt to keep the bears far away. Um, it turns out though, I did, I did finally see a grizzly bear from a distance. She was very safely far away, so I got to see her a bit. But it turns out that that kind of wild encounter, according to a writer like Annie Dillard, might have been really beneficial. It might have been really helpful. Annie Dillard uh, is a poet. She's written novels, memoirs, and essays. You may have read A Pilgrim from Tinker Creek, A Pilgrim at Tinker Creek, which is her most famous work. Um, she won the Pulitzer Prize for the Tinker Creek book. Um, most of Dillard's nonfiction, like the piece I'm going to talk about today, it's a short essay. It's called Living Like Weasels. It really propels the reader in, into the piece. Um, her words are strong and active, even violent in the beginning. Um, and this essay, Dillard encounters this weasel. Um, she writes about meeting this weasel. She's at Holland's Pond. You can see that on here. We'll look at it closely in a second. And Holland's Pond is not, a w not in the wilderness. It's not the back country. She very clearly tells us in the essay that it is suburbia. There is a highway running, a 55 mile an hour highway running on one end of this, this pond. There are beer cans that she tells us about on the ground next to the muskrat holes. There are trails um, of motorcycles that she uses to wander through this space. She is very, very clear, this is suburbia. And yet there's this very wild small animal here. And she comes face to face with this weasel. She asks us, she propels us with her language to get right in there and learn about what this unexpected wild landscape in the middle of the city really can teach us. So she looks, looks this weasel right in the eye. Uh, she shows us she can't escape the weasel. He sort of haunts her for days and she spends time researching and finding out what a weasel is and what they do. Um, and as we read, we realize we can't escape this wild stare either. Um, Dillard's report of the weasel, so the essay is retrospective. She begins by giving us facts about weasels, and I didn't know a lot about them. I'd never really looked this closely at a weasel. They're violent, bloody little creatures, um, and she chooses very violent language. Where Dillard ends up with this weasel in the end is really interesting. She wants to be this weasel. <laughs> she wants to live like a weasel. Um, Dillard's work, uh, many critics will point to some of the, the, the language in her work, particularly in essays like this, as a real difference between modern literature and some of the writing that came earlier, the nature writing in particular that came earlier. Some of that writing was about recording information, recording what one saw. Dillard's really trying to provoke an experience here. She really wants us, I think, as readers to feel what it's like to look a wild animal in the eye. So you have this in front of you. Um, and one, one thing I love about teaching short essay, um, fiction, um, nonfiction, short things, is they, if they're good, <laughs> they're dense, right? There's so much going on in a, in a passage. So um, walking in here today, I thought, well, it's unlikely that people have read this stuff, or you may have read bits and pieces. So I'll give excerpts, and we can talk bits about small parts of this. Unfortunately, this is not all that different than my classroom. I would love to believe that my students have spent lots of time and energy reading and preparing for class. <laughs> but often in these reluctant English classrooms, they may be looking at this for the first time. So don't feel badly <laughs> if we're looking at this and trying to look at it closely. So I will read, and you can follow along with me, and then we'll talk about it just a bit. I come to Holland's Pond not so much to learn how to live as, frankly, to forget about it. That is, I don't think I can learn from a wild animal how to live in particular. But I might learn something of mindlessness, something of the purity of living in the physical sense and the dignity of living without bias or motive. The weasel lives in necessity, and we live in choice. Hating necessity and dying at the last, ignobly in its talons, I would like to live as I should, as the weasel lives as he should. And I suspect that for me, the way is like the weasels, open to time and death painlessly, noticing everything, remembering nothing, choosing the given with a fierce and pointed will. This was in, written in 1982 by Dillard.
I could read it seven times. I think it's beautiful, and I get really excited about the language and, and what she's able to do here. I don't like that weasel picture. And I, just like that bear that I didn't want to see, I don't really think I ever want to run into a weasel. But I think she's saying something really interesting here that is in many ways counterintuitive. For me, and what I talk to my students about when I teach this essay, it, the essay, the writing is about the difference and the contrast between instinct and reason. And we often associate instinct with how animals behave. Like the weasel, he lives not as he thinks he should, but just as he should. Um, and, and Dillard is asking, I think, about what we're missing by relying sometimes exclusively on our reason. Right? We are thinking human beings. We, we love our reason. We love our intellect. It's what sets us apart and it's what we can rely on. But what would it look like if we were mindless? And I love this contrast. I hear a lot about mindfulness and being aware of every choice. But what does mindlessness look like? What is valuable about trusting our gut and our instincts? Can we connect with a wild animal in a wild landscape and gain something from listening to those instinctual um, urges? Maybe, maybe not, but Dillard seems to be suggesting we can learn from that, from that mindlessness. Dillard writes about the purity of living just in the physical. We can see this here in the end of this section. Um, the weasel lives as he should. Um, noticing everything and remembering nothing, moving through the environment um, and being aware um, and seeing all but not attaching to anything in, in specifically. I find this language of should really interesting, living as I should, as the weasel lives as he should. And that comes together to me with the, that contrast in mindfulness and mindlessness. Thinking about what should happen, what does happen, what do we talk ourselves out of, what do we talk ourselves into, and what can we learn from relying both on instinct and reason. She writes about choosing the given, not looking for what's not there, not wanting for more. But seeing um, this wild, almost violent animal finding what he needs in the landscape and not looking for more. She's asking us, what can we learn from the weasel? Which is an animal that I would dismiss, particularly in suburbia, particularly with that highway running by, right? I don't think I want to spend a lot of time with the weasel. Dillard looks to the landscape, specifically to a wild animal in the space around her home for something new. The space is well-traveled. She's been there a lot. She tells us right here in this excerpt that she goes there frequently, right? She comes to this place frequently. She says she could easily go wild like the weasel, but I don't think I believe her. When you read the essay as a whole, she doesn't seem to completely dismiss the intellect. She's looking for some new combination thereof. She can't literally live in the ground or stalk her prey, but she can learn to listen to her instincts and combine that with her intellect and her ability to reason. She's gaining from the weasel. Um, she, she doesn't want to lose part of her wildness, part of the value in being wild to her instinct and to her reason. I think we can learn from her too. That landscape of survival is the weasel's world, but Dillard wants in there. She wants to learn something from that. So she's, as she writes, she, she writes again about that purity of living in a, physical, in a physical sense, living on instinct. So that's Annie Dillard. And that tie to the landscape for Dillard, at least in this essay, comes through that crazy little wild animal. This image is from the thoroughfare outside of Yellowstone Park. Has anyone been to the thoroughfare or heard of it? Yeah, it's a long ways from anything. <laughs> when I was there, um, I spent, we spent about three days camping when I was on my Knowles trip in the thoroughfare. Um, I was told it is the most remote place in the lower 48. I don't know how true that is. It's certainly one of the most remote places. There, in all directions, you could draw a sort of perimeter circle and in all directions there's not a road for 40 miles. Most people got to the thoroughfare like these um, men did on horseback. 
Um, I got to walk there <laughs> with a very heavy backpack, <laughs> which felt really good. Um, another part of the outdoor educator course that I chose, I chose this course specifically, was to, uh, I received a certification as a wilderness first responder which is way outside of my comfort zone. Um, I've been studying English for most of my life and books and um, I am not a, I, I've never wanted to be or had an interest in doing medical work. Um, but again, as I was seeking something to energize my classroom, um, it felt good to do what I tell my students to do, to push outside of one's comfort zone and do something hard and it was hard for me. So we spent about 30, 30 day, three days of our trip um, laid over here exploring the thoroughfare and working on medical care. Um, I learned all about diabetes right there on the side of that river. <laughs> um, there's nothing here. There is mountains and sky and rushing water, lots of weasels probably. Um, but it's a great place to learn to think like a mountain. Um, the next writer that I like to talk to students about and I want to share with you, maybe someone you're familiar with, um, Aldo Leopold um, wrote the essay I'm going to talk about today, uh, Thinking Like a Mountain, as part of his most famous work, A Sand Canny Almanac. Um, Leopold worked for the Forest Service extensively. Um, he wrote the Forest Service's handbook um, on fish and game habits. Um, he created, helped to create and spearheaded the movement for the first national wilderness area, the Gila Wilderness in New Mexico. Um, and he was also a professor of wildlife management. He was an environmentalist and he was a writer. I first read the Sand County Almanac as an undergraduate um, and fell in love with his plain style, his straightforward recording um, that was also beautiful and poetic. Um, the San Calme Almanac was published after Leopold died. He died in 1948. The Almanac was published in 49. At that time, we looked to the outdoor landscape very differently than I think we've begun to look at it now. At that time, we valued the landscape for its ability to turn a profit. What was the value to us as human beings? Um, we didn't see ourselves as interconnected or responsible in the same way that I think we do now. Leopold had a name for this. Um, he called it Abrahamic, as in the land of milk and honey there for the benefit of Abraham's people. And he came to see it very differently um, as he wrote the almanac at the end of his life, he looked back on his activities as a young man working in, in the landscapes of the West. Um, as a very young man, uh, in his 20s I believe, in the early part of the 20th century, Leopold was contracted by the Forest Service to eliminate large predators from northern New Mexico. He was out there gunning down wolves and coyote, um, any large predator to eradicate them. So he began thinking about this and wrote in retrospect about an experience of killing a female wolf on a mountain in New Mexico. And he writes about how that affected him. He writes about a shift in himself and comes up with this well-known concept of thinking like a mountain. So we can go ahead. So this is the piece from Leopold that I'd like to, it's part of this very short essay which I would encourage you to read, the almanac. I've offered the almanac to my students and said, we're gonna read the whole thing because I love it and I get very excited about the wood ducks and everything that he records. They aren't so excited about the wood ducks. <laughs> um, so if you, you may not enjoy the whole thing, it's beautiful writing, but read, read Thinking Like a Mountain. It's just two and a half pages, but it's beautifully written and I think really important. You have this in front of you as well. Every living thing pays heed to that call. To the deer, it is a reminder of the way of all flesh. To the pine, a forecast of midnight scuffles and of blood upon the snow. To the coyote, a promise of gleanings to come. To the cowman, a threat of red ink at the bank. To the hunter, a challenge of fang against bullet. Yet behind these obvious and immediate hopes and fears, there lies a deeper meaning known only to the mountain itself. Only the mountain has lived long enough to listen objectively to the howl of a wolf. I think part of what happens in this essay is that Leopold gives us a very specific tool in which to, so we can use to understand how the landscape affects us and how we are affected, affecting the landscape. Um, he asks us, here's how you do it. You think like a mountain. Pretty abstract, weird concept. 
but he enumerates this call of the wild and how it affects different parts of the wild landscape, including us. He includes us in this wild landscape. He, we aren't separate from wildness for Leopold. We are a part of it. He talks about the deer. The howl of the wolf is to the deer is a reminder of the way of all flesh, right? He's gonna, he might be a goner. Um, to the pine that watches all of it, watches the scuffles and the death on the snow. To the coyote, it's the dinner bell, right? That howl of the wolf. Um, to the cowman, it's a threat, right? The world I grew up in, where cattle were our livelihood, the wolves were scary. Um, and to the hunter, it's a challenge. So he enumerates how this call affects all parts of wildness. But he says one part of the wilderness, the ground, the mountain itself, deals with this differently because the mountain has the option to be objective. There is fear, there is hope, there is an, a wanting in all of these other parts of the wildness that are here, in the deer, in the, in the cowman. We all have hopes wrapped up in this call, or fears wrapped up in this call. But for the mountain, it's objective, right? The wolf is not scary. The wolf is not all good. The wolf is not all bad. The wolf is necessity. So just as the rancher lives in mortal fear of that wolf getting that new baby calf, that at my house it was that new Angus laying on the ground, that, that baby bull on the ground, the mountain fears the deer. If we don't have the natural culling that comes from the deer, according to Leopold, the mountain is destroyed. There's too much grazing by deer. There are too many um, paths all across that mountain, too many game trails. The mountain needs that wolf, right? It's an objective viewpoint. He's, I think that Leopold in the entire essay, but particularly in this passage, is pointing to the interconnectedness, that nature and wildness is not outside of us, that we are a part of it, and we affect it much as it affects us. I love this idea that we can, we can practice thinking like a mountain. It's hard and it's abstract, but we can practice. When we step outside of our cabin at Spiro and think about what happens to the ground when we use it. And we can think back to Leopold and this idea that we all heed something. We heed that call of the wolf. He reminds us to think like the mountain, to consider that interconnected nature of our world, that we are completely inseparable from the soil under our boots. And that's what I felt like I was looking to get back in touch with when I was walking through, through the Beartooth Mountains. <clears throat> it's loud and clear in many ways, I think. Leopold killed that wolf. He shot it and he writes about, in this essay, about watching the green light glint from her eyes. And he feels that shift. He feels like it might be possible to move toward objectivity that the mountain has. And he coined this phrase and takes it with him um, and brings it really to the world in, in a Sand County almanac. It's hard to get students excited about wood ducks and weasels, but they like to talk about wolves, <laughs> especially if they're Wyoming students. So this is the trail out for me. This was about day 28, um, headed out of the Beartooth Mountains, back to Lander to see my not so little boys, um, and my husband, one of my little boys, you weren't there, were you? <laughs> um, it was a very bittersweet uh, leaving of the mountains for me. It was by far one of the best experiences of my life, but I was so anxious to see my family and get back to my classroom and my students. About day 28, um, I got to take a test in the mountains for that outdoor wilderness certification. I teach English, I don't take tests, I write essays. <laughs> so I had, uh, I was, I remember being very nervous to take a multiple choice test. I had to do it in a tent, in a downpour, um, on the ground, um, but it was an interesting end. And I think they do the test at the end on purpose because otherwise I don't think anyone would want to go home. Um, uh, that part was hard to leave, so they put the test at the end. Um, one of the things that I did when I was preparing to leave for this Knowles adventure was I spent a ridiculous 
amount of time, it was a very silly amount of time, trying to decide what book I would take with me. My mother's laughing. <laughs> My friends, Amy is probably laughing too. I asked everyone I could think of, what should I take? I only get one book and it's 30 days. What am I gonna do? And I went back and forth. I even crowdsourced on the internet. I wrote on my blog about <laughs> choosing a book and had people write me from all over the country and say, oh, you should take this and you should take that. I took a novel that I'd never finished that was very long and it was paperback. That was, that was ultimately how I chose. But my mother suggested, as she has my whole life, that I should take poetry with me because we can read poetry over and over and over and it, can, it changes as we change. We can see in the density of the language, we can see difference. I didn't listen, I took that novel. I was really worried that poetry might be a little too cerebral for my, my trail-worn soul, that I wouldn't be able to concentrate. And it turns out that I was reading so much about broken legs and learning how to splint arms and <laughs> give injections that I didn't have a lot of time to read my novel. Um, but I should have carried Wendell Berry with me. Luckily, I got to come home to Wendell Berry. Um, I always tell my students who show up in my classroom, I don't teach a lot of poetry. When I teach an introduction to literature course, I teach poetry. And they slump in their chairs and go, oh, poetry. <laughs> um, but I do teach a little. Um, and Wendell Berry is my favorite. Um, he is the poet that made me learn to love reading poetry and learn how to teach poetry. Berry is a novelist, an essayist, and a poet, and a farmer. He's from Port Royal, Kentucky. <coughs> Barry calls himself a placed person. He's very famous for saying this. He is a placed person. Some of you may have read Wallace Stegner talking about the stickers that they stick in place. As I was preparing to talk to you about Wendell Barry and tell you why I love him so much, I read some of what Stegner has written about Barry. And he writes a lot about this idea of being placed. This seems kind of contrary to a lot of what Americans love to do, myself included. We wander, we like to wander, we like to discover, we value diversity, we bring it into our country, I hope, as much as we can. And Barry seems to be telling us something a bit different. He's interested in sticking and being a placed person. And I think by that he's suggesting that we need to know exactly where we stand, no matter where it is. But there's great value in knowing that place that you think you know, that place that we call home. And Barry seems to be suggesting that we stay there um, as much as we can in some ways and learn as much as we can from that part of the landscape. I often tell my students to go wander the world. As I said at the beginning, I spent a lot of, a lot of my time um, when I was first married wandering Europe with a backpack and it's one of the most valuable experiences. I set out on this mountain wander, um, but I offer this poem as an alternative. Barry seems to be making another suggestion when he tells us to stay home. In a 1992 interview, Barry says that the essential wisdom, essential wisdom, so the most important kind of wisdom, accumulates in a community, much as fertility builds in the soil. He's a farmer, right? So he, he hangs onto that soil in a very concrete, very specific kind of way. So sometimes we have to stay put in a place to understand ourselves. So I'm really glad I got to come home. Barry also claims, and this is what Stegner pointed to, Barry also claims that if we do not understand where we are, we cannot possibly begin to understand who we are. And Barry goes back to that over and over and over. So this is a relatively new Barry poem to me. I have lots of favorites and I have a book with me that I brought up the mountain that's full of my favorites. But this is a new one. Um, and it, it, it was perfect for the end of my adventure in the mountains. It's called Stay Home. I will wait here in the fields to see how well the rain brings on the grass. In the labor of the fields, longer than a man's life, I am at home. Don't come with me. You stay home too. I will be standing in the woods where the old trees move only with the wind and then with gravity. In the stillness of the trees, I am at home. Don't come with me. You stay home too. Barry wrote this poem in direct response to a, a, a Robert Frost poem called Pasture. And in that poem, Frost invites the speaker, we don't know if it was Frost, invites his reader 
into the pasture. And Barry is re 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 responding and saying, no, stay home. Don't come to my home, find your own home. Stay in your home, there is value there. Um, I am the daughter of ranchers, the daughter of a farmer. So I love this imagery of um, watching the rain bring on the grass. Now, just the concept of watching the grass grow <laughs> is hard to wrap your mind around. But noticing, <laughs> noticing those details and that slowness kind of propels the reader into thinking about staying put and what that might really look like and might, what it might feel like and the value that is there. <coughs> he tells us to wait, getting at this idea that time is important and it takes us back to that idea that like the soil, the fertility that builds in the soil, that knowledge builds and sort of a generational investment in a place. And that's what home really is, right? It's an investment, it's a return. I've done a lot of traveling, I've wandered, I'm always wandering, but I always come back. And like Barry, I can feel that generational pull from the soil and from the ground. <clears throat> he refers pretty directly to that when he talks about the labor of the fields longer than a man's life. This knowledge exceeds us. Our identity is not just in who we are physically and what we have accomplished, but in that heritage that we are made aware of by the land, by the landscape. To answering that question, I hope for my students about what we can learn from literature about the land and how it affects us and our personal identities. And again, he says, if we do not do this, if we do not know the space under our feet, we cannot know ourselves. He is standing, he is not moving. The only movement in the poem comes from gravity and the wind, those unavoidable movements that human beings have no control over. He is being affected by the place and he finds knowledge in staying. The old trees are rooted, and that only movement comes when they're moved by the ground. He suggests that home is the deep, long-term knowledge of a physical landscape. And he reminds us by telling us, you stay at home too, don't come with me, go to your home. But this is different and apparent for all of us. Um, I, if you haven't read Barry, if you haven't picked up a Wendell Berry poem, um, there are so many that are, uh, speak so directly to being a Westerner, even though he's from Kentucky. I would encourage you to pick them up. All right. So to wrap up, uh, this was towards the end of my trip. This is the 4th of July, um, right near the Continental Divide. You can see our little pyramid tents. We had four and five people in those tents. <laughs> some pretty close quarters. Um, and I kept coming back to this incredible sense of self I, while I was on this trip. And that wildness and all of that I loved about literature of the outdoors sort of came back to me and I had this new energy to bring to my classroom. But of course I kept going back to that place of home, just like Barry suggested. I fell in love with words and books and literature as a young child. I blame it on my parents who took away the television um, and made us read. It worked for me, it did not work for my brother. Um, <laughs> sorry, Mathers. <laughs> um, but I, I fell in love with books very early. When I was about 15, my, my dear mother handed me Cormac McCarthy's book, All the Pretty Horses. And um, it is sad in the way that McCarthy is always sad. He is so raw and unencumbered. His very spare language and descriptions led me through a place I still have never been, may never go, that arid South Texas. So I rode right alongside John Grady on his horse into Mexico, into jail, into love. Um, and I, I understood and felt South Texas. And I pick up McCarthy and I can still feel it. Um, my mom gave me the book because she had read it and it reminded her of her father, my grandfather, who trained horses for the army when he was a teenager. I think he was about 17. And she, she gave it to me as a way to understand where I came from. She tells a great story about the, the, All the Pretty Horses is part of a trilogy that McCarthy wrote and she tells a great story about running back to the library to get the next book and they said, well, it hasn't been written yet. <laughs> um, I, at 15, through really incredible literature, had a connection with a man I never knew, with a place I will never know. 
Um, I fell in love with that, that soil and that dusty wind just sort of sweeped off the page and into my memory, which is incredible. And at 15, I understood that power of literature. And I, I, I struggle and strive to bring that into my classroom, that power that is right there on the page in front of you. Whether you get there and wander for 100 miles like I was fortunate enough to do, or just sit with Annie Dillard or Wendell Berry. All the Pretty Horses made me want to be a writer. I'm still working on that part. But it taught me how to use place and how to use literature to inspire people to think about their effect on the world. My work at the community college um, often has me meeting, meeting students at a very reluctant place. Most balk at studying literature. Many of them just hate to read. Um, and others are just, they're, they're certain they're going to miss that text sort of proverbial secret. They, you know, they look to that, to the, the over-analytical instructor to kind of unlock those secrets. So when they look at the course schedule at Sheridan College and they see outdoor literature, it sounds like the least of some evils, I think. <laughs> um, maybe it'll be entertaining, but they really don't know what they're going to learn when they step into the classroom. It just seems tolerable. So I tell them that literature becomes a tool for discovery, that like me, they can wander through the mountains or wander through the arid Texas uh, cattle space or into their backyard to find a weasel. I tell them that this is an easy tool for discovery. Uh, it's really a low risk way to experience something new. And it seems sort of obvious, but when I ask students to read about weasels or think like mountains, they aren't really sure where to start. And they certainly don't have a great sense of themselves in the literature. So we start, and they stumble, and they stutter start, and we go to the easiest connection. We think about ourselves and the world around us through the literature. So my challenge to you, as my community students, is to look for the wild. Look for the weasel in your backyard. We have these trails, if you live nearby in Sheridan, that go right through our community. Look for the weasel, look for the wild, confront that nasty little creature in your own backyard. I challenge you to think like a mountain. Look for interconnectedness and the consequences of our actions when it comes to the landscape. What does it have to teach us? How can we affect it? And I challenge you to take Barry's advice, to know and to understand, to figure out if he's right. Can we possibly know who we are if we don't know where we are? That's what I have for you today. Thank you. So I gave you the excerpt so you can find the full um, poetry and, and short essays. Um, I did read a few new things as I was getting ready to talk to you, and I just wanted those to be there as well. Um, something directly, for, uh, interview directly from Barry uh, Stegner's um, essay, The Sense of a Place is Fabulous. Um, and then I read a little bit more uh, of a PhD who, is a, who specializes in Dillard. So. <laughs> um, I read part of a novel, The World According to Garp. <laughs> I did not finish it. Um, there is actually a great story about that. I, um, my husband said, well, I'm going to read the same book that you are going to read so that when you get back, I can feel like I was there with you. Because I didn't see or speak to my family for, for 30 days. And uh, he reads more slowly than I do. Um, and he worked really hard to finish the novel. And, <laughs> and I didn't finish it. <laughs> I was so busy. I was very busy. I was reading a lot of medical textbooks. And yeah, it was good. It was good. Yes? That also teaches that sense of place? Um, I do. We read a lot as a family. Um, but right now, I just let them read whatever they're willing to read. <laughs> they're 11 and 12. Um, we read in the car a lot. We read out loud. We drive a lot because we live in Wyoming and we, we travel. And we're, in, we're, we're in the mountains a lot. Um, and um, I read out loud to them as often as I can. And I get to pick when I read out loud. Often, I think they're not listening, that they're plugged into those little uh, annoying devices in the back. But um, <laughs> I listen. <laughs> I. Um, I read Barbara Kingsolver's um, nonfiction book out loud in the car and, uh, about growing one's own food for a year. They heard every word. We, it comes up in conversation a lot. So um, I think place is so important to me. I, was, I grew up in my grandparents' home, um, walking on my grandparents' ranch. Um, 
unlike most kids in that situation, uh, I got out as quickly as I could and ran far, far away. Um, and it wasn't until I left that I realized how much a part of me that, that land was. So hopefully my, my children are getting it. I don't know. We'll see. They have to go to the mountains. They're still young enough. I can make them go. <laughs> yes. So who is carrying these tests and medical textbooks in three days? <laughs> me. Me. Yeah. Uh, we carried very heavy backpacks. Knowles is um, sometimes criticized for their, their heavy weights, so we, d we divvied up our entire load and everybody carried um, what proportionally to, to size made sense. So we all we carried um, everything. We had two re-rations, so pack horses, you saw the thoroughfare picture, pack horses brought us in food when we, we had run out. Our longest ration period was 11 days and my pack was about 85 pounds at, on that first day. Yeah. Uh, there was another young woman on my trip, another teacher who weighed 95 pounds, and her pack, or I think her pack was about 60 that day, but she only weighed 95 pounds. <laughs> so there's something, I run into it often with writers and uh, thinkers, there's something about physical space and physical work that seems to be necessary for someone who works creatively. Um, I, I, I run and it's, it's necessary for me to have that physical sort of nothingness, that mindlessness that, that Dillard writes about in order to be creative. So I think it's a pretty, pretty common combination. Thank you.